deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Uh, welcome, Steph, to the Think About It podcast today. I'm so happy to have you here. So we're here with Stefanos Gerolanos, who is an author, a historian, uh, uh, and he's written this book, The Invention of Prehistory, Empire, Violence, and Our Obsession with Human Origins. So first of all, congratulations on this new book, and I'm thank really you. excited to have a conversation and learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we both teach at NYU. We are in New York right now. And I want to start us out maybe by some of the things that I'm aware of in our culture, which is a paleo diet, uh -huh. reptile lizard brain, fight or flight, Lucy, or like our sort of common grandmother, like sapiens versus Neanderthals, um, innate aggression versus cultural aggression, tools make the man, all these ideas that have dinosaurs, like where we come from, that it informed who we are. And I want to start out by asking, why did you write a book on prehistory, this mm -hmm. moment in time that's kind of lost to us, that, but everybody for the last 250 years seems to have been so invested in recreating and bringing to life in a completely exciting way. Right. So first off, thank you for having me, Uli. This is really Sure, it's fun, fun yeah. So um, I like you, like many others, I just simply would get excited about where things were, things that would show up either on my feed or in the news or in, you know, some sort of Scientific American article that would uh, come up as it went. And the way that I kept thinking about it is that there's always a, a quiet definition of what it means to be human. It's there. You don't really have it explicit, but you have some hints. And uh, so sapiens versus Neanderthal, you know, humans as tool makers in the computer age. Uh, what else did you cite before? The lizard brain, which was particularly popular in 2016 with Trump's election. We all come out of Africa. Exactly. In, in a good, thrilling way we share something or exactly. in a way we've escaped some other state of being. Exactly. And so there, there was a way in which I kept thinking, I can never tell in all these publications how much of this is coming out of serious science right. and how much of this is coming out because it's a concept that's used. And somehow with, you know, with little moments that I was studying for totally different reasons, I just kept thinking the politics of this is very strange. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the people involved in these stories have, you know, it's like they, they have a kind of return of the repressed attitude, like they had been treated as though they were um, you know, charlatans early on in their uh, scientific life, and then yeah. suddenly they turn out to be right, okay. and they go completely all in, yeah. as aggressive as they possibly could. And I found this totally fascinating. And so it was a little bit like story by story. Right. I kept uh, finding that they, it's not that the science is bad, it's that so much work is defined by the concepts that people use. And that gets super exciting on the one hand, because it is about the common language that we all use and sometimes that scientists use, but that trickles back and forth. Right. And then a lot of the time it's just really grim, politically really grim stuff. And I, I just kept thinking, you know, where is it that the colonial so so story ends and the scientific story begins? And very often it's quite nicely separated and very often they're just basically one and the same. But so that was the, the, the backstory. The right? idea of prehistory, like yeah. where is that in both in actual history, and I never get these things right, is it 3 million years or 300,000? I don't, I'm not accurate about any of these things. Like where's prehistory? So like, I totally love that because that's kind of the problem. In some versions of prehistory yeah. or well into the 19th century, it was entirely unclear to everybody involved how far in the past it was. For the most part, it was far enough in the past for Europeans to look like colonized peoples elsewhere. Okay. So the basic idea was oh, that okay. you could, if you could draw the comparison yeah. and say our ancestors look like X. Like people then, that Europeans met in other places. Exactly. So in some ways, so the, 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 the people we were once are like the people today we're encountering in other parts of the world. That's, That's exactly the right. European fantasy. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So it's as though from the ancient Germans uh, that Tacitus uh, had written about in Caesar and, and right. so on, they had moved in the later 19th century to saying, well, the Neanderthal is far in the past, probably like the people of the Andaman Islands or like Aboriginal Australians. And so that vagueness 
then follows a history of the different sciences. One version is you get the linguists for whom language is all that matters, and they don't have a kind of temporal scenario that they know how long it's taken. Because we have no evidence change. whether how and how exactly. and whether language was used. Exactly, okay. or yeah. where it comes from. Right. So then they start finding motherlands, basically, for yeah. Indo-European languages to come from, and contrasting them with languages, either Semitic languages or other languages that they see in Europe, Basque and Northwest Caucasian languages. The evolutionists couldn't care less about this. And so for them, it's a kind of calculation of how long it would go. And other people are archaeologists, and they say, well, it's pretty clear that there is a real distinction between stone and bronze. Okay. And then we can subdivide as to how it goes. And so in large part, the easy solution that most people work with is prehistory is pre-agricultural, so pre-Mesopotamia. But the Mesopotamian argument is from the 1920s, 1930s. Okay. Um, pre-agriculture. Pre-agriculture, pre-writing. Pre-writing, um, yes. And pre-bronze. So pre basically ne the Neolithic period, but those are not entirely and, mappable. And for a lot of the time, they weren't mappable at all. And let me ask you a question. Of, is this, and I don't know if I'm right at all. That's fine. Is this, this, this starts developing, let's say, roughly around like 1800, a little before that. Is that because we're starting to think maybe we're not descendants of Adam and Eve and there's a kind of secular need for a story that explains yes. where we come from. And before that, the story is given to us by religion. We come from our forefathers and the church tells us who they were. That's basically So right. this is a secular idea that we need to find what is this prehistory if it's not paradise from which we've been expelled. That's exactly right. So there are okay. ways in which religion and religious people try to negotiate this. I right. find the negotiation really interesting. Really interesting, yeah. But for the most part, this is basically a secular idea. But they it's, move, to, let's say, the religious people. And in your book, you kind of leave them behind in a way. Yes, and, and maybe unfairly, but it, for the most yeah, part, they're left behind. Yeah. But it's sort of the discussion you, you're chronicling. It's 250 years of people debating. And it's funny in a way that they're arguing about who we were once yes. with a huge amount of fervor and passion. Yes. Like, I had Melissa Schwartzberg on here on Rousseau, yes. which I really like, and I always teach that kind of this idea, which I, as far as I know, he never used the term noble savage himself, yes. Rousseau, but this idea that we were once more innocent and then property becomes the problem. And there are these moments when we used to live in a certain way and then something is introduced or we invent something and then we get corrupted or we become who we are today. Right. And so one, some, some of these versions, you know, so first Rousseau, the book starts with Rousseau in large part because I think that the way he flips the state of nature argument produces a set of possibilities for the people that come after so him. So tell me how he, switch, so, how he switches that state of nature argument. As opposed to suggesting that there's a kind of straight up progress since the state of nature. State of nature is, I don't use so much the word innocence as, as a kind of, there's a kind of purity yeah. uh, to it. And so people after him have to negotiate. Do we go with a kind of semi-Rousseauian story so about the, the beginning? So the first one is we go from this right, purity savagery, and then right, we move up right. in uh, some way or move on or how does... Right. So one version is the kind of Hobbesian savagery to, you know, modern civilization. Okay. The Rousseauian argument is basically that the beginnings are not a version of, of a savage story. Yeah. Um, there is violence. There is strength. But there is a kind of purity to those which is unlike society as we get to learn it. But then you have all these people from Herder to Isaac Eislin and, and others who have to negotiate, now what exactly are we supposed to do? And come up with various scenarios in which you may have a version of a noble savage. You may not really care for a version of a noble savage, but you have to negotiate the purity, innocence, sort of rise, decline, various options, depending on the politics that you have. And that becomes the basis, I think, Thanks to which, when the geological revolution hits uh, in the early 1800s, that, be the, that negotiation of what the beginning was like becomes the basis for really asking again exactly when did human beings show up. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, in the absence of a kind of divine guarantee, what exactly were they? And that is a real switch from a religiously based um, yeah. standpoint to a much more secular one. And when we want to know where we come from in this in this more scientific way, not just, you know, God placed us here or something like that, or Adam is the original forefather. Why do you think there is this kind of urge? Because in your title, you have the obsession with origins. And yeah. I studied, I was very fortunate, I studied with Jacques Derrida, yeah. who was really interested and who actually said, we do need origin stories. Yes. 
he just said they are just quite complicated and he would sort of deconstruct them and he said, but like in my memory, Derrida was not opposed to them. He said they're right. necessary because they give us a sense of where we come from because it may give us some roadmap of where, who we are today and where we will be. Yeah. So do you think this tracing, this origin, is this book, do you think there's a problem with finding an origin and putting that story in there? And you, there's a lot of really popular books, as we know right now, mm -hmm. that sort of say this is the beginning point. I mean, I think the problem is not so much that... It's not as though I could write a book that would get rid of origins. <laughs> That's not <laughs> yeah. the, the form. And I'm very much with the Derrida argument from The Origin of Geometry, that there is something about the moment that's presumed pure, something yeah. about this moment that's presumed to be a kind of ignition yeah, yeah. Uh, scenario, which is that it isn't all as simple as that. And it gets really interesting when we start examining what mm -hmm. would that space be. So the way that I'd put it simply is, I love these origin scenarios and these origin stories, but very often there is a political consequence to this argument. If you follow a sort of Yuval Harari argument, right then you're left with an idea of human beings as basically capable in large numbers of making what they think into reality. So and Harari, so this is the book Sapiens, that's big the book bestseller, Sapiens, which exactly. a lot of people read. And so he has this idea that we form ideas, we share these ideas, and then we all kind of Move muddle together them. to enact yes. this idea. Yes. It's a kind of amazing thing that creativity is what exactly. makes us human. Exactly. Like and that. that's like a 90s and 2000s scenario. Yeah. yeah. And it comes from an argument about the cognitive revolution. He repackages it. He gives it a much yeah. more Silicon Valley scenario. But so, but most of our lives are not really that creative. They're, <laughs> you know, like the boring <laughs> right. things from a supermarket to something else. Right. Life is not an app. And so yeah. if there is a way in which his book fits perfectly with a moment in which there is a real uh, receptivity for something like, how is it that the world will look different, will look better? Okay. How can my phone use and, and so yeah. on? If you have someone like Way, uh, Graeber and Wengro, they- So that book a, is called The Dawn of Everything. The Dawn of Everything. Which, and, and what does, what, what do they posit as, where do we come from? What's okay. in the beginning? What so, happens in the beginning? So in their version, what matters really is the Neolithic revolution. It's a moment of great, um, so we would talk about two, three, four thousand years ago. It's a, it's a, it's a moment of a kind of um, upheaval. It's a moment when people move into uh, much more, well, not, I meant two, three, four thousand years BC, uh, not ago. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's a moment when people move into settlements, but they don't really move into very stable settlements. Okay. For them, this is a moment of a kind of cultural anarchy. Okay. It suggests that, that human beings are less forced by the state. You know, they like to put yeah. down here, then yeah. they move, they decide to go somewhere yeah. else, they uh, see how they go, and things are sort of up in the air. And that's a vision of humanity, which has also to do with the desire not to be you know, politically overdefined in the present moment, which is one of Graeber's political priorities. And they find, so in this book, The Dawn of Everything, they find yeah. some way to be self-aware and our present, to say mm -hmm. since things were more disorganized and people had yes. different options and one option becomes maybe dominant, but it's not necessarily the right one. That's right. So it's a contingency. That's right. And Harari satisfies what need that we want to believe about ourselves. So I'm much more sympathetic to their version. Yeah. Um, Harari's version, I think, is the one that you read before bed to tell you that tomorrow morning you're going to be creative, you're going to make the future. If you are a kind of, you know, Silicon Valley person, you're really building new gods. I mean, that's the terminology right. that he uses. And I find that... But weird. is that only, is yeah. it really only tech bros? Isn't it also a little bit like, I kind of want to believe this too. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. kind of want to believe that actually I exactly. have this, I have some potential in me that is innate. And this yes. is where it goes back to all the stories you tell in this book, that I want to find something in me. And if I look at these creatures from millions of years ago. Somehow I think there's something more real to me than all this, what you call yes. in one of your chapters, the veneer yes. of civilization. Yes. I hope it's not pure aggression, yes. but I hope there's something in me that's human, but not hasn't been shaped by my social context. Yes. So I think we look back at these so that's, ancient So that's the other version. Right? I think you gave the extended version of what I was hoping to get to in a way, which is that in the absence of another definition for what human is, yeah. 
origins fill the gap. And so it's not origins as an origin science most of the time. Right. It's the reception of that. And origin science also feeds this, tries yeah, to publicize yeah. itself. But so it's the way in which instead of having a kind of hard definition, this is human, that is not, because we can't really do that today. Yeah. We easily move into that um, kind of scenario. If we tell the story this way, that's the origin myth and where we're going. And I totally want to believe that I'm at once anarchic, super creative, and this and that. But there is a way Wait, in which you can say... Wait, you want to be anarchic, super, super creative? Super what, creative, what, what else do we have? What would you like to believe like in some oh, regard? And this is not you as a scientist, but to <laughs> yes. say... Because your book is really about this investment we have. And in some ways, what I loved about the book, that you think there's a bunch of natural scientists, paleontologists, historians, lay people, archaeologists, all these people dreaming up things. There are some stars in here, like Darwin, yes. or big names, but that everybody's sort of household names, but they satisfy something. So you want to be anarchic, self-creative, <laughs> there because there is a like, there's something positive. That's what I want to get yes. to first, before like, oh my God, we have all this, these stories are producing bad politics. They're also right. producing something else. Yes. I think that there's a way in which several of the stories tell us that the world could indeed be different, yeah. that we could yeah. uh, c contribute to something that's both scientifically rigorous and politically transformative. Okay, okay. I think that we all love a version of this scenario, which yeah. is why these are books that succeed at times. It's, it's not always the case. Yeah. Uh, but the telling the story in a particular way rather than another, and I want to give one, one quick example, mm -hmm. um, allows you to escape certain politically problematic things. Now, these politically problematic things change at different moments, yeah. but it is something that helps. So. In the post-war period, and this is one of my favorite chapters in, in terms of the what did I come yeah. out liking. Um, in the post-war moment, a really key uh, switch has to do with technology, where they begin to think, in order to avoid a kind of biological evolutionism, which leads to racism, leads to eugenics, leads to all sorts of um, political disasters yeah. at that point, um, thinking of Africans as killer apes and so on. Um, they move to technology and they say like basically it's these stone tools that make okay. all the difference. Yeah. And why do they make the difference? Because we didn't start with big brained humans. We, you know, yeah. we, whoever yeah. this we was, yeah. um, were apes who at first had used their hands for locomotion and then began to hit stones against each other. And the stones become like organs of the body mm -hmm. and begin to transform it. So mm -hmm, that's why mm -hmm. we get a sort of straight posture. That's why the, the, our heads have kind of shrunk compared to uh, ape or Australopithecus yeah. heads. And the idea is that basically um, the tools themselves created by humans basically created next to next to next generations okay. of humans. That scenario... Wait, stay with me, this for a moment. So the yeah, tools yeah. we... We don't know, accidentally, intentionally, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We created, they then start transforming us. Exactly. In our use of tools. We, be, we become more human. Because the okay. idea is that, you know, if you're bent like this, you really can't really hit the stone. You can't lift both your hands to okay. hit the stones. Whereas if you're somewhat more balanced, okay. then you can hit the stones okay. further. So okay. you gradually have these sorts of shifts by people pushing back and, yeah. Yeah. and so on. That idea that our technical being is essential to our, yeah. you know, not thinking to our bodies and so on. I mean, it's essential to someone like Stiegler, uh, but it's, I think, also a story that we've grown to live with. And why do you and like this? Why do you like then. this story? Because it places because it's, it's not, not a kind of to exactly. us as a biological or a thinking animal or what? Right. So I think I started getting into the story to say they pick this specifically to avoid the biology. Mm -hmm. And I like the story in a way for this, that mm -hmm, they've come mm -hmm. up with a, something that's not exactly a humanism. Yeah. The, yeah. the motor of history is, is technology. Right. It's not simply a big brain ape or a bigger brain ape or a figure of dominance or a figure of revolution or something right. like that. There is something that's entirely uncontrollable by us. And but in story. your book, you don't really show your cards so much. Yeah, like in right. some ways, you look, play kind of close to the vest because you, I, I didn't really get a sense like, oh, this is the story that Stefan Oz really likes. You said, this is a story, this is a story, this is a story. And there was a little part of me where I thought, I was trying to make sense of the book and I thought it's so many different stories. They all serve contemporary purposes. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like the American philosopher Richard Rorty who said yes. a very convincing and well-told story 
is going to be the foundation of our morality because yes. he didn't believe there was innate morality. So a, a well-told story shared by people, etc., that has certain characteristics. That's an effective story that makes us into who we are. Yeah. And you sort of chronicle these stories. So the one is with the tools. Yes. And tell me like two or three other ones, how we become I mean, which who we are. Which ones do I love? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to put it. There's a way in which the people that I liked the most that I was reading were the people who lived in doubt. So yeah. Juliet Mitchell, Georges Bataille, um, you know, to a degree Freud as well. Yeah. Though I'm, I'm, I'm more on the skeptic Freud yeah, yeah, than yeah. the Freud of building the primal father. And they share it's skepticism the, in what sense? In the they're not willing to be told a story that's entirely satisfying, that you can kind of overthrow one prehistory, come up with your own one, and then Like, let's say on. that it's not the so, tools, but it's right. language, or it's right. the bigger... And so what other right. options so think, are, what so other think, models example, are there? Uh, when Mitchell writes Psychoanalysis and Feminism, a big So this is 1970s, a kind of feminist five. critique of a yes. male-dominated field. And right, a, yeah. but, but she's basically saying, like, look, Freud is not here to be... We can't overthrow Freud as if we simply got rid of the patriarchy with him. He's an excellent tool for thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So how do we get more analytical tools for thinking about where we came from rather than saying we came out of this relationship between male and female... Okay. Um, apes. And is her that's sorry, more of a surprise in that case. At that moment, it's a surprise. Is her criticism also because the story that had been told was hunter gatherer, man goes out, hunts big game, yes. woman stays at home, takes care of the kids. This kind of nuclear story, which has been which yes. the Museum of Natural History in New York City, which we all, I mean, I love. I love my it kids too. Love. I love it too. I love but all it, this it, stuff. That's it the told the story, and I think when yes. you go into that, yes. those dioramas, they they tell a story. And Juliet Mitchell yeah. said they somehow tell a story that may have. And is she trying to say this may not have been what it was? Or that's right. So both she and so there's a whole generation in the seventies of feminists who say the man the hunter scenario is really BS. Uh, we have a, it's not simply man, man the hunter, woman the gatherer. Yeah. But then comes the second generation, which is closer to Mitchell and is the um, uh, is is also the archaeoanthropologist Margaret Conkey and others who say like. Well, actually, we really don't know anything about yeah. Yeah. anything that they were doing in this space. And do we, we know, need to understand do we the know anything? <laughs> well, it appears that we know a lot more at this point in, yeah. the, in that we have skeletons, for example, where women, it's clear that um, female early humans uh, would use archery, okay. uh, would use, um, okay. um, what do you call Bow and arrow. Uh, bow yeah. and arrow, yeah. thank you. Uh, archery, um, <laughs> I was thinking before. So. Um, so it's clear that there is a complexity, but that complexity is not solved. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't get reduced to something easy, and it doesn't mean that geographically it's not very different here than it is over okay. there. Okay. So, or even among different ethnic groups. But so your book is not way, really cons not, but uh, your book is not concerned with what is really the truth of this, and right. do we like? Entirely is right. there going to be the scientific discovery coming along, and we'll have on our phone an alert, and they finally found whatnot? This was the 19th yes. century obsession. We're going to find the missing link. We're going to find this. We're going to find that. Your book is not about that. Your book is more like there's evidence, and people will create a story out of that or a yes. theory, right? Yes. And you're saying this and story serves, it. and then the story the story will change. But what's interesting to me is that people will go to do the next bit of their scientific research with that story oh, in so, mind. Okay. And some of that yeah. story will get perpetuated. Yeah. And sometimes when they overthrow one story, they yeah. will move straight into another story they had overthrown only very recently okay. because the options are very limited. So it's true. I and didn't write the book to get to what the truth yeah, would be yeah. because then that would be kind of recreating what everybody else is doing. I was more interested in, and I am much more interested in, uh, how is it that people think? Yeah, how is it yeah, that yeah, if we yeah. take something that's both vast and relatively specific, in what way do people, do scientists, as well as lay people like me, um, turn around to say, um, when I encounter this evidence, these are the words I use, these are the images I have in mind, these are the the metaphors that come into right, the right. Uh, into place, like these ideas that travel that we don't know that they travel, or we don't notice that they travel. And we don't notice um, because these concepts or images or ideas are they sort of 
part of our vocabulary and we're not aware that someone created them because they seem intuitive to us by this point? Or I think that's right. They just that, become so... But there's a kind of intuitive scenario. So I have one example. I remember an article in the um, New York Times maybe five, six years ago yeah. um, in which they had found a new homonym on an island in Indonesia. And so the scientist uh, that they're speaking with is, is describing, it's a fascinating setup. And at the end, someone says, well, how did they get to this island and this island alone? And someone in the group responds, well, we think that they were washed off, you know, some other island and ended up here, maybe during a tsunami. And I, I would, think it's a novel by Daniel Defoe called the, the, Robinson yeah, Crusoe. Well, I think I've read it. That, my reaction was like, <laughs> wait, this is great. It's kind of amazing that they could... Statistically, it's impossible. There's no possible way that somebody could, that you could have two, you know, not, not to say more of a particular species that end up there. And then you have to say, well, part of the setup is that clearly we cannot think about ancients as seafarers. Yeah. It's clearly that we don't have better evidence and we land on that possible solution. Huh. We have the kind of automatic question. And then, but I remember reading it and having spent already a couple of years working on this yeah. and being like, that is amazing. Wait, no, wait, no, that's no, that can't be. And so, but I had this reaction all the time. They, you'll learn things like, you know, Neanderthal genes are responsible for nicotine addiction, obesity, and this and that. Mm -hmm. And that sounds, it's like you nod ahead, and at some point you mm -hmm. have to say, well, also responsible is the fact that I smoke, or that oh, I eat, right. or okay. that this okay. is the kind of culture I'm in. So... The genetic part, interesting. We're yeah. probably not going to, to end up with a fully genetic explanation of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is a little bit tricky when we get these sorts of explanations that are published and republished and republished. What was it the other day? Um, Neanderthals are responsible for us, for some of us being morning people. That doesn't mean anything. In a way, you know, maybe genetically, and, and Phil, but we don't wake up early be out of our genetic. Fill me so. in on the Neanderthal sapiens yes. tale, which drives a little bit of the story of yes. yeah, Harari. But in your book, where does the Neanderthal fit in and what does it do? Because it's a word we use today kind of yeah. almost as a slur, it's like you're such a Neanderthal that's supposed to be crude, yes. uncivilized, not sophisticated, yeah. brutish. Yes. Right. Um, over masculine. Over masculine. Yeah, so, yeah. so where does um, the Neanderthal, if you just give me that, where does he, when does he, when is he discovered, and what does he do in our like self understanding? So, I say in the book that the Neanderthal is discovered in a debate okay. in around 1860. Okay. After a particular um, cranial dome uh, has been discovered in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf yeah. in, in Germany. Yeah. There have been several other skulls at that point that have been discovered. In other places, knows. right? In other places, yeah. in Gibraltar. So he's named Washington. after a place, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that's the one that sparks the discussion. Yeah. And from the beginning, the question is, is this human or is this just outside of a human? Okay. Is it a quote-unquote extinct race or is it a different species of some sort? Okay. And you get all sorts of debates. And what which, would it make uh, a difference if it were not a human species, like this other species? Why, mm -hmm. what, why would that be important at that time in the... I think that at the time, it, 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 there was a real question as to whether this was an, uh, an originator of modern humans. Yeah, yeah. And so in Germany, one debate hinges on whether this is simply a pathological case or a set of pathological okay. cases. Um, or were the ancestors of the ancient Germani, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, something like this. Yeah, yeah. Are these like the most indigenous people Europe ever had? Okay. And so you end up having hmm. the question of, oh, and there's an additional question which has to do with uh, monogenistic versus polygenistic hypotheses. So could this resemble somebody from the Andaman Islands or somebody from somewhere in Africa? Okay. Is the debate that they had was, does this indicate separate conceptions? Uh, are the racial differences so significant? Um, are we so superior to this as we are to others and so on? And then this becomes a debate that basically takes, it develops two images. One image is a kind of colonial brutish image where the, the Neanderthal looks ever more like a gorilla um, and is seen as being just beyond the limits of the human. Okay. So for example, the Neanderthals, um, the Neanderthal sculptures made in Belgium at the time that Belgium was brutalizing the Congo um, look particularly ape-like. Okay. The Neanderthals look particularly ape-like. Um, in the other tradition, you have the idea that Neanderthals are kind of our mirrors. 
They could, we could have been them. Okay. And there are moments when people begin discussing this around 1910, but very, very cautiously, and they're really not very sure of it. That's not the public perception. The public perception is the public perception you just described. And from the 1950s, you have first a story of Neanderthals as oppressed by sapiens, as being a kind of, I remember one book the Neanderthals rediscovered that says basically by the 1970s, they become like the super Indian, like a kind of super stereotype. They're super trackers. They know how to live in the, the harshest conditions possible mm -hmm, to humans mm -hmm. and so on. So you get these two stories. One scenario is the backwards um, uh, the, the backwards brutish mm -hmm. humans that we would have been. And the other scenario is these are our siblings. Okay. And that basically has been resolved effectively through the genetic um, study, at least in the sense that the scientists, yeah. including Svan Tepabo, who won the Nobel Prize for decoding with his lab the, the, the Neanderthal genome, uh, that scenario is the one that says, like, look, we don't, the old version was of the brutish Neanderthal. The current version is much closer to, these were very similar to us. They were capable, perhaps, of art. There's a debate around whether they were, right. uh, they made the earliest yeah. art. Um, and so it seems as though, as one population of, you know, relatively small but unclear size, Neanderthals are no longer to be seen in that okay. description. One messy consequence of this is that Neanderthals are also now depicted as white and blonde and blue-eyed. And all of the major reconstructions of the last 20 years... It's a bit of an overcorrection. Well, you see, so it's like corrected <laughs> to the point where you just have to say, do, I hope that somebody begins to notice that this is a politically really tricky scenario yeah. because then you, you yeah. look online, which I unfortunately had to do to make yeah. sure that this was the case. Right. And people will say, yeah, how did diversity work for the Neanderthals? All these Africans came in oh, and killed yeah. them. And so yeah. there's a, yeah. or mated with them and swamped them. There are scientific papers that refer to gen uh, genetic swamping. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to end up at this point of just saying, we do need a measure of doubt yeah. to go back to the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. earlier discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And we do need a scenario where we can't be saying we. We did this, we were that, we, we, we. Okay. There has to be a kind of they early, early, okay. you know, early yeah. modern humans, so to yeah, speak, yeah, yeah. Um, versus other yeah. species. But there can't be an identification because the moment there's that identification, yeah. what would have been a scientific story becomes a popular and a personal myth that people then use in a kind of Harari or, or other fashion. Although in your book, you don't really... Yeah. I didn't really feel that you made this distinction as you just did so clearly. Yeah. It would be a popular story versus a scientific story because yeah. especially, in, it seems to me, in the 19th century, but up to today, scientific it's, stories are also yes. popular and cultural stories. Yes. And as you said, they're not totally free from this and they just use scientific objectivity and everybody else is now using a kind of like weak version of this and comes up with their own political stories. Yes. You're saying the problem is that even these scientific paradigms are informed yes. by all sorts of belief systems, yes. right? I mean, first off, remember the, the, the key problem. Every, every scientist has to get, at some point in their life, a grant. Yeah. In the grant, they're not going to say... No, they used say, to be the, like you know. <laughs> sons of rich families. Well, yes, <laughs> there that was, was that. Maybe that was a I different that, story. I think that, that was the way they did it in the 19th century. But now, it's, but now the scenario says, you know, we need to study these like finger bones, right? Yeah. You're not going to write, I, I've written grants too, you're not yeah. going to write at the end, what will they show me, what the, you know, f second knuckle was like. You're <laughs> going to say it tells us something really essential right. about the advent yeah. of tools and yeah, the advent yeah, yeah. of humanity. Now, when you end to that scenario, yeah. you've already brought in all this, okay. this outside yeah, yeah, yeah. world. I don't think that there's a strict dis distinction, also because we have quite different sciences in operation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So geneticists are not doing the same thing as archaeologists are, mm -hmm, are doing. Mm -hmm. Archaeologists are not doing the same thing as, you know, geologists are going to end up working in mm -hmm. or as other people who do neuroscientific work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these people are not doing the same as you would get in a museum. And in a way, it's a complex of sciences out of which there isn't exactly a very straightforward story that yeah, comes out. Yeah. It's not a simple solution. Now, that's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. We yeah. don't need to be acting as though we need a, a, a yeah. version of like, here's how we solved all the problems in one, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. one fell swoop. 
And in the process of this, a kind of popular language is going to creep in, even if you're trying to be really rigorous. Right. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing because you need to be translatable yeah. to, yeah. to people. So yeah. that becomes a kind of curiosity. What I'm trying to say with all this is that I'm not, I haven't written this to say scientists are horrible or that they're wrong or this or that, nor that scientists are good and people are horrible, but just to say that there is a dynamic that is often really troubling. And just as we need to be you know, concerned about other troubling yeah. matters in life, yeah. this is a dynamic that's also to be, we, we also should be concerned with. And that dynamic is one in which old theories survive even weird all theories survive. Mm -hmm. um, theories that have relatively little scientific purchase survive mm -hmm. and thrive. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, scientific theories have to exist and learn to exist with this kind of language that is not simply theirs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is what it means for us as humans to be wondering who we are as humans. But unfortunately, it also means that we can't help it at times, but create these long stories in complete ignorance of the politics yeah. that comes with it. Part of what I wanted to also to do with the book was to say, I don't think that anybody's paying attention to how profoundly problematic even our heroes in these stories are. Mm -hmm. So the problem is not to say, you know, Darwin was a eugenicist, therefore be gone Darwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good luck with that. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is to say- And good thing, good luck because it seeped into their culture. And even if we say, we'll in this shorthand, which was not really productive, we yeah. cancel Darwin. Darwin has already sort of actually shaped subsequent thinking in a way that we can't even really exactly. trace. Exactly. Yeah. So even, and at the end of the day, whatever we do with Darwin, yeah. eugenicism is all over uh, contemporary culture. We thought it had been gone and it's, and, and it's come back. And how do you mean in what sense? I mean, first off, in, in far right, in various far right political schemes, yeah, yeah. that would be one scenario. I think the other scenario where we accept genetic explanations for things is a real problem. So this, like Neanderthals, tell us that our weight issues are because of that. No, they're because of a social system. And you think there's a problem live. to substitute this idea? Uh, we are this way yes. because here's the proof. This old story. These people used to do this, and yes. you're saying it sort of takes away the need to analyze where we are right now, what our conditions exactly. are. So instead of say, like, exactly. look, I'm a kind of, I get really easily angry because, and that's probably because my ancestors three million years ago got angry a lot, or yeah, sure. I can't right. resist sugar true. because like I learned this from, you know, Michael Pollan or something like yes. that. Like, because when I find a bush of berries, I have to eat all of it. Yes. Because yes, I used yes. to live in the savanna. So you're um, thinking this absolves of, of some current responsibility. Exactly. Okay. I think that's the problem. I think the problem is it, that Human beings now have virtually no, are, are virtually incomparable to human beings 100 years ago. So that's a big takeaway. Much away. more from a very long yeah. time ago. So that's a big takeaway of the book that you're saying, yeah. we need to study these origin stories. I also do believe we need some stories of where we sure. come from. It's important sure. for us because to be totally adrift makes people not very comfortable. Yes. Um, then you're saying we are so different from the people, these our so-called ancestors. We are so different, much more different than we can imagine that to sort of create this, this story, this yeah. developmental story, whether it's decline or ascent, it doesn't matter. We go up or we go down, we come from there. That it has not very little to do with us. Exactly right. But it does yes. fulfill this. And the, I wanted to go back to one thing about the political uses of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually felt in some cases, they were also good things because they yes. revised the story and sort of it's not only, but it is a really important part, kind of, let's say, the feminist critique of a kind of male-centered paleontology or something that was productive. So in yes. some ways you can say the origin stories are not just, they all lead to horrible conspiracy oh, sure. theories sure, 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 or sure. they also lead to other things because they liberate us maybe to thinking, oh, we could be different. Yes. Maybe the whole story was wrong yes. and maybe actually... There is something in me that I didn't really know yet. Yes, and that's why I was sticking, that's why in a way I was keeping my cards close and sticking with the doubters uh, yeah, at this. Yeah. That the skeptics, in a way, allow me a position where I don't have to say this, I think, is what, yeah. you know, this, whatever I propose is going to be bunk within 15 years or so. Right, right, right. But so I do think that there are politically positive things that can come out of it. I do think that we are essentially cyborgs in a way that, you know, ancient hominids were not. Uh, you know, maybe they were in some relation to the tools that they used or the clothes that they made and right. so on and so forth. Um, 
but you know our food comes from every item that's on our table comes from a different corner of the world um, our relationship to our screens uh, is dramatic enough as to possibly someday have physiological consequences mm -hmm. um, to put it very vaguely um, mm -hmm. our capacity to communicate with people and to you know our, our, our capacity to drug our bodies and to add various uh, replacement bones and so right. on it, are right. so massive yeah. that that is a different lifespan, a different relationship to life, a different, you know, capacity to create yeah, yeah, than yeah. they would have had. Right. Now, it doesn't mean that that's a good or a bad thing, um, yeah. but it is a fact yeah. of, it's a, it's a certain fact of life thanks to which we need to be able to not say we when we refer to that okay. antiquity. Yeah. We'll get better stories with a little bit of care, with yeah. a little bit greater care. Yeah. Um, and at some level, we might start to ask, it's not like we're not asking it, but we're not going to get an easy solution. We're going to uh, have to ask, how do we live 200 years into the future as the cyborgs and energy users and, mm -hmm. you know, environment destroyers that we are? It may not be the, po the, the horrible politics that mm -hmm. we know of, mm -hmm. of, you know, the colonial period that I discussed or the Nazi period, which mm -hmm. similarly... I think had everything to do with the way that the Nazis imagined, or at least Hitler especially imagined, uh, Aryan Semitic uh, mm -hmm. origins. We may not be there, but the environment situation mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. exactly doing that great, and is not exactly about to do any better. Yeah. But to do this, we cannot totally dispense with the moral force of an origin story. And sure. the moral power of these stories is so important. And I want to go to maybe one example where you say that a, a sentence by Charles Darwin was written into a UNESCO declaration right after World yes. War II, sort of with the shared humanity. And I yes. read the sentence because you make sort of a bit of it and say it's not necessarily right or wrong, but it's an important moment um, where people take a sentence from Darwin and sort of say, we all are human deep down. Yes. And we all connect. And then they make it into a kind of post-World War II. Racism has brought has terrible ended, evil. Yeah. But I'll have to find the quote. It's at in, the very beginning of the next chapter. Uh, of this next chapter? Oh, the one right after patriarchy. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'll read this. This is from Darwin, right? And this is then quoted in after World War II to, sh to say we actually share more than we di that divides us, yeah. right? As man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there's only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a very lofty and wonderful sentiment to say we yes. first extend our sympathies to the people in our family, then in our tribe, then our village, our community, our whatever the next organization is, and ultimately to men of all nations and races. Yes. And you think, Darwin is problematic. This is written in the 1860s. It's 1871. 1871. I think it's in the first edition. And of the. And what is made of, of this idea? That sort of right. what you're saying that these, as divide, divide all these stories, all these people are arguing so much, and some of these people we know, and some of the people I didn't know, and they're all arguing about this. But they, if he's saying, but we're all human and we share something, isn't, yes. this, isn't this what the origin sort of stands for? In some yes, way? I think that's right. The, the funny part is that this paragraph has a history of its own. I only noticed this because I, I kept finding it. Yeah. Um, and so in Darwin's version, it's a sort of Victorian top-down, you know, we all have, we all can have sympathy for every human being, but most human beings can't have sympathy because they are not that advanced. Okay. So then we've reached this level that we can magnanimously... Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We sort yeah. of magnanimously grant this to everybody. <laughs> yeah. And then after World War II, the, the argument is twisted mm -hmm. to say, we are all human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's high time. Mm -hmm. You know, what would UNESCO be if it couldn't say this? Mm -hmm. uh, and they even have a kind of internal fight as they're preparing the declaration, the statement on race. Yes. To say, you know, racism is, is scientifically bunk. Yeah. Um, and they include it there. And then yeah. since the 80s, there's stage three of this, which is that people who insist that, you know, we are great beings of progress, quote this passage, very often while describing, yeah. you know, 
indigenous brutality or picking stories of indigenous uh, brutality. Right. And so Jared Diamond uh, paraphrases it. Uh, E.O. Wilson uses it at, at, at great length. So there's a way in which... So Jared the Diamond is kind of a historian of this... He, right. A, um, gun steel, what's the guns, first, Germans, and Steel. Guns, Germans, and Steel. And what's the next um, book that he writes? And then the most re the, the re more recent yeah. big one was The World Until Yesterday. The World Until Yesterday, right. And The World Until Yesterday includes scenes of extraordinarily detailed descriptions of violence among indigenous uh, yeah. Papuan uh, peoples. Uh, and tries to revise a then existing story that this violence is not that major into an argument that it's really big, utterly brutal, and so on. Okay. And there is a way of saying that that is a distinction. Our world and the world until yesterday okay, okay. is something tricky to use this with. Yeah. Steven Pinker similarly has a scenario where yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, we're all advancing in all this way. So, you know universalism is easy but it turns out universalism well, hasn't been so easy i've had all this stanley time. fish on this podcast and he would say he's very funny and he would say and proof to the contrary is all of recorded history there we go and That's in some ways what stanley it's... fish is saying what the pink argument which i'm not that interested in in a way he would say there is no proof actually yeah but also stanley yeah. fish is very smart he says recorded history meaning yes. he knows fully well there's a lot of unrecorded history of course of course. But so what you're saying, they're using this argument in the 70s and 80s to sort of say, oh, we are actually more advanced than these sort of indigenous tribes who haven't really reached our state yet. Okay, or so that they haven't reached the capacity to extend their sympathies and reach peace like we can. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, that's not working very well for anybody. That's right not very now, historical so. because maybe there's also a reason why they wouldn't extend their sympathies to the people. Of course, <laughs> but, but, so, but also there's a way of just saying, I'm... I, I'm perfectly willing to admit that there are, you know, different, there are differentials of peace mm -hmm. and war under different mm -hmm. circumstances. It's more to suggest that definition of humanity or that description of a definition of humanity, which also has a kind of moral compass, translates into very different political projects. Okay. And if, I mean, it appears at the end of the book again to talk about this idea of how innate is our aggression mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, right so you have is this the chapter this is not the chapter the thin veneer or this no is sort it's, of, but there's a is, it's a translation so the way that the book works in a way is that there are these chapters that do more or less the same thing but try to show how a different language negotiates much the same yeah, problem yeah, yeah. and how these concepts tell the story of the problem so this chapter this now is this the is the end, later chapter aggression. on aggression this right. is the it's chapter the, is in, is our, is violence ingrained is violence ingrained and how, and how. okay yeah, yeah. So that's the scenario. It's to say that there are multiple options. There are multiple ways of using these chapters. I recently learned that, you know, for example, Lech Walesa used it, same passage. It's, it's one of these okay. moments that people, that are easy quotations yeah, and easily yeah, yeah. used because the sentiment sounds excellent. Right. And we don't really think, you know, you use this expression and what you mean is other people can't extend their sympathies to the rest of Okay. of humanity okay. itself. Okay. Um, but when the debate comes in, you know, um, then there can be more tricky, difficult right. cases. Right. So I think there are many, many definitions all through the book where seen on their own sound great. Mm -hmm. Seen in context mm -hmm. sound more complicated, mm -hmm. sometimes more promising. At other times, they have a kind of promise that's closed off. That's among the things that I find really interesting. There's a promise to something, and then a short while later, it turns out that that promise was was okay. You know, didn't pan out exactly in any particular. And is that is that how you see your work, kind of as a like you sort of a historian of discourse? So I don't know how yeah. you describe your job actually. Like yeah. how we describe that? Like what did you actually do in this book? Sort of, sort of. I mean, it's a bit academic, but like, what's the genre of this book? It's like a history of histories. I mean, I think of, yeah, I think of it as a history of concepts and expressions and images that that live on. Yeah, yeah. And it's not only, a, so it's not only, it's not a history of paleontology, that's for sure. Right, right. Um, but it is a history of how people think about themselves and about their yeah, origins yeah. beyond the national level. Yeah, yeah. That's the way that I would, that I would put it. What I was trying to do was to say huh. what we think we are doing. So at some basic level, it's very structuralist, I suppose. What we think we are doing is so determined by the language that we use. 
mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. the language that we use seeps in and affects the results that come out of it mm-hmm. until the language gets reshaped mm-hmm. in ways that are actually quite unpredictable mm-hmm. uh, or very mm-hmm. often quite mm-hmm. unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And then as the, you know, as the the, the conceptual mm-hmm. web changes or moves yeah then that history sh- points us in a different direction and lets us see also see. things in the previous ones that we yes. necessarily couldn't see yes like to be a little bit of a kind of academic nerdy but i'm quite interested in some if you thought of your own methodology like in terms of the big historians sort of who is yeah. your what's is is this more kind of a Foucauldian analysis a genealogy rather than a straight up history or is it like, i'm just yeah. curious how you situate yourself as in, um, and maybe you don't have gulp. to. Uh, <laughs> gulp. Yeah, so. no, you don't have to at all. But I, I, I actually, and I'm asking this also for a reason because, you know, we both teach at NYU and yeah. I have a lot of students who are, uh, sometimes to my surprise, actually rather interested in these kind of methodological debates of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Of, yes. Is, is this I more like a Hayden White approach? Is this a Foucault yeah. approach? He said it's structuralist, but structuralism sort of is it going yeah. to the dire- dire- direction of more right i mean i don't have an exact scenario the, yeah. way, the way that i would describe it is that there's a mixture you know how roland bart used to say that he doesn't have um i don't have a method i have habits the man who had the method so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I, I sort yeah. of feel like i have habits and some habits are um i admire conceptual history of the style of kozelek or of georges conguilhem where there are one, two, or more concepts that are related to one another. Okay. Um, two, I do admire a Foucault-style history of, you know, not exactly history, but if, uh, a study of discourse which has a genealogical set of, that changes over time, let's say, uh, but where you also study the human sciences and dimensions of power. So and that it, would be the second. Remind thing. me, because I've done, yeah. I, but like, it's been a while my Foucault too. is, you know, <laughs> like rusty, but like, his approach is not historical. He wanted right. to make a big distinction. He said, mine is genealogical. Yes. What's the difference? I mean, at one level, f- the way that I would put it is that in the early work, there is a, there's a much thicker, denser episteme that is much more determinant of knowledge as it is. And yeah. So the question yeah. are the, the epistemological premises rather than the actual results found. But, so it's not it's okay. not the results a scientist finds, but the premises that they begin with. Yeah, that yeah. I'm very close to. I feel very much yeah, the yeah. the pool of historical epistemology in that in that regard. The way he writes a history of the birth of the clinic or of yes, or punish or these stories like yes, or the switch in you know between let's say old um, versions of sovereign power to then disciplinary and securitarian yeah. economic yeah, power yeah, and yeah, so on yeah. in, in that set of lectures. But you're looking at kind of how concepts, but images, one. metaphors yes. are mobilized, used, adapted, changed, transformed, disputed, exactly. but not necessarily are they true or not. And that yes, wasn't, that wasn't Foucault's interest as much. Like he said, it wasn't like they were right, they were wrong. Right. He they, goes into the, the whole argument of truth telling later on yeah, right. and what that the, is at stake there. I try to simply balance. It's not whether they're true or not, because I, I don't, at some basic level, I want to leave it open that things that appear untrue now yeah. and resoundingly denounced in a decade maybe back right, right, with right. a vengeance. It just happens too often. So there is an element of that of the Foucault. There's an element of the concepts and metaphors. So that's because I like Conguilhem and really Blumenberg at some level. I've ended up with a deep admiration of this idea that metaphors are you know, if not even, even if they don't precede concepts, that they cohabit a certain world with the concepts. Okay. Uh, he, that's why part of the book is expressions, not really. Yeah, it's yeah, committed yeah. to expressions, not right, really concepts. Right. Um, I, I'm somewhere between all this. I tend to describe this the, these projects as a mixture of a history of concepts and historical epistemology. Yeah, yeah. On, on what principles did people know what they knew? Yeah. Or did people know yeah. what oh, questions right. to ask? Not what answers they would get, but what they took for granted. But I like this on what principles do they know what they know, yeah. which is kind of not quite epistemology, but we do know things based on principles that we're not necessarily aware of or they're so exactly. intuitive or we were taught. I exactly. also feel the book is kind of a sort of exciting story, intellectual story. And I think in, you write in the introduction or in the credits or something, you've been teaching a class at NYU for quite a long time that has changed over time. Yes. And can you say like one word maybe of how your students or sort of how they, because I think 
we are all like, I mean, I love Jurassic Park. I like things like that. You know, I do like Black Panther. Like, I'm like, there's a certain kind of investment in various stories, and we all grew up. Some of these pictures, the picture on the cover of this book, I grew yes. up with this image. That's the thing. Like, yes. I saw this, and I somehow can, and I'm very connected as a, I feel like a child again in a kind of excited way. Like, wow, this yes. is a hunter the mammoth. I really wanted to include several images it, like this, yeah, which people would yeah. kind of be like, oh, I know this. And you actually show yourself yes. once in the book when say you yes. and your sister watch some yes. TV show. Like exactly. Once you show exactly. up and you just say, you say, we watched the show about like some... like." It took me <laughs> years to find man. out what it was. It took me years to figure oh, out what it was. But you had it in your mind. I knew, I mean, I knew the images right. so clearly uh, from it. I, I remember the burial of the Neanderthal. We were talking 30, 35 right, years right, right. ago. And how did um, this teaching so, inform this book? Because it's a very... Like your style yes. is really like I actually am really full of admiration for your style for the following reason that you're very generous and you say these people, some of them may just be kooks and completely off. And then you say sometimes really like sort of slightly ironic, like Freud was wholly unoriginal in this. <laughs> it's kind of a compliment and also not like yes. you don't trash people. You yes. don't say they're all off. You say yeah. someone writes a deceptive hodgepodge. We won't name yeah. who that is. And these are <laughs> yes. But it's how does the te how did the teaching inform the writing of this book? Because this is really not a strictly academic book. Right. So um, we did all the theory part and I uh, made every effort to hide the theory uh, in the book and not to write with it because yeah, it matters yeah. to me that this be readable. Yeah. Um, there were multiple ways in which the lectures, um, so I did this one class that was in the core curriculum and that's a required the, class it's for a required college class. and my students. Yeah. Yes. So it's not like all students took it, but a number of people, yeah. about yeah. you know, 120 students for several years. Yeah. And one was, you know, in an obvious way, the questions they would ask or the response papers that they would yeah. write yeah. gave me a sense of what it is that I wasn't aware of or yeah. I wasn't aware of, you know, I didn't know I didn't know. Okay, <laughs> Again, right. Okay, that's I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't you picking was up You were yourself not aware that maybe you were... Exactly. You, your exactly. thinking was based on premises that you didn't even know. Yes, exactly. You know, like, how did you get there? I thought like, oh, this is an easy solution. Or I would <laughs> right. give a lecture and then yeah. people would ask particular things yeah. and then students would also often say I, that they... So often they would say something quite different than what I'd expected. So the whole discussion of shamanism oh, yeah. in the chapter about cave paintings, um, I had not even noticed having shown cave paintings yeah, and yeah. that there are moments in, in, there are moments of discussions of shamans. And I just thought like, oh, you know, of course. It never occurred to me that there was a specific mm -hmm. Mircea uh story and then a story, Ernesto de Martino and other people that were in a kind of background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. So in many respects, just people picking things up. So you had to difference. read all this and find yes. out what there's a much deeper thing to. You thought exactly. shaman, and I get this. And I, in I reality, thought oh, had no idea it had what, always existed. You had right. no idea what that was. Completely post-war story, very <laughs> yeah. specific, yeah, yeah, yeah. big shift. Yeah. Even with my editor, at some point, he said, "Oh, you've been saying that this is animism and shamanism since the beginning." And I thought, "Oh, I really don't get it. It's they're very particular." Yeah. But there was a real way in which the student, with the students, it made a difference, which is that. I had started writing this book as an academic book and it was getting unwieldy and I wrote an essay that was 20,000 words long <laughs> about something extremely specific that basically gets three sentences in the okay, book. Okay, wow. It's that's how, yeah. and at some point I realized this was not going to, to work. Yep, but yep. what I did do um, is I recorded myself lecturing okay. in order to create so I prepared the PowerPoints mm -hmm. and I recorded the lecture that I was giving mm -hmm. with very few notes. Mm -hmm. I would have the quotes, I would have particular elements, sure. but the idea was if I transcribe this recording, yeah. then does it sound like I'm not talking yeah. in a thoroughly academic right, fashion? Right. Am I talking, just as we were saying on another occasion, to somebody who's 18 to 20, yeah. has had a year of college. Like Elle, a student necessarily... right here. Hi, and were you students? So, uh, <laughs> senior, uh, however, senior. much more sophisticated. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. But that, but that was the idea. It was like if you didn't care to know much more about this, if you came to it right. out of nowhere, yeah, um, could you actually read it? But that's on having, you then to explain basic. enough to keep it interesting, be correct, yes, but keep on translating into several ways for someone who's not an expert to understand that. Exactly. So you do this here, and you're very deft at sort of saying. This is the way they're thinking about it. 
you can think about this when you can follow along. So yes. you're telling yeah. a story. Actually. You're very kind, but that's basically yeah. the way that I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be a scenario where people yeah. just thought you could pick it up somewhere right. in the middle of the book like, and just play with the next 20 pages. I'm going to ask you another question yes. about this book. So we'll end with this origin fantasy. So you now have the, you're going to be the cyborg. You want to be in 200 years. You have the capacity to travel back in time. You go to some moment in this prehistory. What is the one thing you really want to know? What did they do? What did they not do? And you'll have, you have a five minute moment and you can be a safe witness to some scene. What do you want to see? Oh man, wow. <laughs> wow. I want to see the cave painters. Do you want to see the cave painters in action? The one thing that I love really? more than anything. I, I, you know, I, it's, it's so peculiar because I, I tried to come up with why is it that this is happening? Why am I so moved by these okay. cave paintings yeah. that I've never seen the original of, by the way? And Very you saw the Werner Herzog movie recently where he thinks they invented cinema. I love the movie until <laughs> the end when somehow they're all cinematographers. And I'm like... But the, I don't know if that's what they are, but anyway, see, but there, so you want to be in Lasco, you want to be inside I the want cave, to be in Chauvet and just torches. see what it is that they're doing, what it is that they're excited about, why is it that they, why does it move them? Yeah. Because at some basic level, there was a period when nobody was making art, and then there was a period when people were okay. making this. Okay. I don't know that this is art, because yeah. I also think it, it's unfair to give it the term already. Okay. It's, it's, it's yeah, our yeah, term, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I'm so utterly fascinated and moved by these works. Works which sometimes are, you know, they will paint a bison and the shoulder of the bison will be in the part of the wall that's protruding. Um, right. In other cases, yeah. I just saw in a, in a prehistomania show in Paris, it's called Pre Pre Prehistomania uh, at the Musée de l'Homme. You see some versions of the cave paintings and you realize that the auroch in one case or a bison or a horse is inside the cracks of the wall. Like there's, they've kind of made sure that they fill it to a corner, but it feels trapped as though it can't break wow. out of it. Wow. That sort of thing, yeah. I'm really moved about. So give me five minutes. Can you with visit them any of the that. caves today still, or are most of them closed to? There are visitors. very few who are where you can visit. They're yeah. um, Combarel, not Combarel. Ah, I will make this. Uh, I will not get the right one. Yeah. Uh, but you can visit a couple. You can visit rock paintings in the rest of the world. I've uh, seen petroglyphs in Australia. There you go. And petroglyphs I was very well. fortunate. I yes. went to, uh, to oh. Arnhem Land and uh, Kakadu Island and I saw some petroglyphs. Was, was and so that's that. There's that's something, that's it, but, yeah. but I think there is something to think that people, someone made this. Yes. And in some ways made this, I, what maybe, I don't know if this is what you feel, but they communicated something about themselves and their world. Yes. And it's very amazing that they communicate and we can yes. receive this communication. Yes, we can receive something of this communication yeah. and I can't know what, but I can, you know, I can't yeah. know what comes with it. So that, that indeci yeah. in, in decision, I suppose, is one, but also the sheer idea of what extraordinary involvement, traditions, what must have been generations of painting and, right. yeah. and uh, scraping into the wall and so on would have gone into at a time when hunger was real and in ways that would be impossible to imagine right, um, right. today. Right. And it's also, you can visit like Lascaux 2 and Lascaux 3 even, and then Chauvet 2 and so on. Okay. But that's not quite the same thing because as you know, a, a cave has an almost singular feel to it. You go into a cave and you know the humidity, the dankness, the, the kind of smell of the cave, the breath of it, Every cave is different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can never quite have a sense of what this was supposed to mean or what the cold or right, and so on. Right, so right. I'm fascinated by this almost secular holy of holies that comes out of these caves huh. and huh. the immense aura, the hold that they have yeah, on yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which I cannot at all yeah, explain. Yeah, yeah. I like your Benjaminian moment. <laughs> when I do like, <laughs> there are times sort of like there's this old history yes. right in front of us. Yeah. Yes, so thank you. Really. Thank Steph. you so much, Rulie. The invention of so. uh, prehistory, empire, violence, and our obsession with human origins on the Think About It podcast and video. Thank you, Al, for thank filming you, Al. us today. A couple of references we had today: Rousseau, Foucault, Darwin, other people. The other episodes of the podcast and uh, congratulations on this beautiful book. Thank you so much, Rudy. Thank you. This is perfect. Thanks. Awesome.